Welcome to tonight's New York Technology Council event. Delighted to have you here. As you all no doubt noticed, we're videotaping this, so uh, be advised. First, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. We're a nonprofit. We wouldn't be here without them. I won't read all of their names, but we appreciate all of them. And a special thanks to Pivotal Labs for making this space available to us. We've done some other events here, and they've been very generous, and uh, we appreciate that very much. And with that, let me uh, welcome Alexis Maybach, uh, who, as you all know, is co-founder of Guild Group and author of uh, Invitation Only. Uh, there'll be a book signing following. There are books available for your purchase, if you so desire. Good evening, good evening. Um, first of all, thank you for coming out tonight on a, uh, ooh, on a Thursday evening um, before the weekend, and uh, you warned me of that. So I was going to take a little bit of time just talking about milk, some of the early days, the early decisions that. I think we're critical to the success of Yoke. We're critical in uh, the way that any one in 20 businesses really succeed from a startup standpoint. Um, and it takes so many things to go right. So I'm not going to focus on a lot. I'm not going to say we're at the end of the road either, but I'm going to talk about things that I think are going to go today. Um, in addition, I, I've been asked to speak a little bit about what's next for Yoke is where we're going as well as have uh, time for Q&A and, 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 and the like. So please get any questions ready for you. We have time for that at the end. Um, it was November 13, 2007, when Gilt was about to offer its first sale. And it was funny, it was probably about four blocks up where we were in a, this typical makeshift startup office. It was pretty much like rock center back there. And we had five of us huddled, huddled together, shoulder to shoulder, in, the, in that office. Um, we had three people out in a Brooklyn warehouse. And it was exciting. We were about to offer our very first sale of what was the exact closing product. Are, are there any male members of Yogurt in the audience? So most people are pretty familiar with it. Uh, okay, I'll give a little bit of background as I get forward. But that morning, um, we had taken uh, and that group of five, uh, a couple co-founders, um, Alexandra is, is the co-founder who's there for kind of a book review, as well as a, a number of interns that were, as I mentioned, staffed out in a Brooklyn warehouse. And that morning, looking back, we had only just 10 days before sent out invitations to friends of friends and friends of friends to join. We had lasted out to about 15,000 people, about 13,000 of them to sign up for our very first sale, which we thought, uh, was, was exceeding our expectations, but still knew there, there was a very long way to go. We frankly didn't know if any of them would actually turn up uh, on the first day of our sales or what to do. And it was just four months before that morning that we had left our jobs. We had taken time to determine what we're going to name the business, uh, had spoken to probably dozens of brands, convinced them, one, e-commerce is a great thing for you to even consider. We know you're not selling online right now. We know you're selling on the internet, but e-commerce is going to do amazing things for you as a business. So the education process has already kicked off, working with what uh, is still today predominantly luxury providers we work with, who are not known for loving to uh, offering their products at a discounted price in general. Uh, but certainly, we're very fearful of doing that uh, at the time online. And secondarily, we were having to convince them to sell them on a new startup. Here's a business. Here's what it will do for you. Don't, we don't yet have a prototype or beta site isn't yet working, but trust us and sketching it out on napkins and, and the like. It was, it was really a, a push to give a kind of leap of faith for asking a lot of these brands to take with us. And we'd spent time over those four months getting up to speed a lot of things we've never been exposed to. How to pick warehousing space in the New York, New Jersey area. How to identify if it had any sort of mafia involvement something I never, ever thought I'd have to figure out if I had an e-commerce background in Silicon Valley. 
Uh, but, and I do have funny stories about that, but I do, you know, there were some facilities we went to that had these doors that were literally kind of chained shut during work hours, and we walked out thinking, oh my god, that's definitely not how we want to build our business. And um, that four month sprint, getting the idea up and running, identifying what we would name it, was a testament to how short the business cycles have become. In this day and age, it's shrunk even further. If I look out the window and see what's happening across New York City alone, in what seems like a number of weeks often, where ideas pick legs and get out the door. For us, the four months was a testament to how quickly we, we could make uh, something out of a, an idea we were passionate about, pursue it, hire a small team, and just get it out the door in as quickly as we possibly could. Um, that morning, like all, like all mornings, and I know there's a number of entrepreneurs probably here in the audience, um, coming to start up our entrepreneurial uh, meeting folks we have, and investors. Okay. So, um, you know, it was we were at the edge of our seat in terms of, you know, we had brought these people on board, but would anyone show up? Would they want to shop this way? Uh, would they come back? Um, would we be able to get another brand if that first brand didn't sell anything? Would we have to completely pivot our idea to think about the opportunity differently? And as we kind of hit go and, and let that first sale go live, for those of you not familiar with Dill Group, we, we offer sales on a daily basis that uh, feature a brand, a coveted brand that you might find in department stores a store like Marnie's or a Nordstrom, at prices up to 70% off. And it's spread much further than that. The initial concept was really around uh, apparel and accessory, uh, driven sales, the excitement, the uh, rushing into the front door to purchase something you deeply coveted. And um, we watched the first four minutes pass and nothing really happened. And then we ticked into the fifth minute and still nothing happened. And then we watched our first sale go to Missouri, followed quickly by a second sale to South Carolina. And we just exhilarated at the moment because we thought, oh, we don't know these people. No one's doing us a favor. This isn't a friend who's purchasing. And it was the first sign that we had that this idea had actually started to go viral, that it had spread to many corners, potentially, of the, of the country. And third purchase went to San Francisco at 9.07, roughly, in the morning. And we realized right then that we had forgotten an entire swath of our country. We had made uh, California, a woman in San Francisco, get up at 6.07 a.m. to buy a handbag. We really had overlooked and made a, made a major mistake there. So we pushed it back a couple hours and eventually three hours to where the sales are today at noon. And uh, that, that morning, we watched many other items fly up the door. Um, and by the afternoon, we had sold out of every single product we had featured. And uh, it was a, a, certainly a relief. It was a relief that, wow, you know, there's something here that other brands might want to come and work with us now. With other brands coming, we could perhaps raise our first round of capital. Mm -hmm. And with the raising our first round of capital, we could build up the team we needed to further pursue this idea. Um, I don't want to make it sound simple by any means. It was a process from there on forward that we never could have envisioned where that initial team of about eight people over the following four years uh, four years would go to over a thousand employees mostly here in Manhattan that that initial sale with one brand would result over six thousand that we were selling today day in and day out and that we would be building a business that would go through one of the cycles uh, fastest cycles of hyper growth in, in recent memory uh, not only would that fast growth ensue, but we were looking at a business that every quarter would be different. The challenges would uh, change uh, so much that we would really have to re-envision our, our business at almost every step along the path. Um, we really believe in kind of getting the product out there, learning alongside with our customers, so much that that morning when we launched our site, an e-commerce site, we pushed that business out the door, and we hadn't yet in the build a return section. We thought, all right, someone's gonna come in and buy, but it's gonna be at least six days before they look for the return area. <laughs> so we have that much time to build it. And why build it before we know if anyone's gonna purchase? So we took that philosophy through many steps of the build process as we grew on forward. And, um, and, uh, and, and looking, forward and then what was that initial warehouse space in Brooklyn would also move to be about 
over 500,000 square feet that we operate today, largely uh, manned by no longer human manual pick and packers, but actually small keeper robots. These very cute little guys, two by two, who zoom across the floor at 30 miles an hour, 600 of them missing each other by a tenth of an inch, to go grab your Hugo Boss suit, or to go grab that critical clutch that you need to have for this weekend coming up. So, while it's a very simple idea in this space, the idea of creating flash sales in which hundreds of thousands of people rush in to buy a good that they covet, uh, brands that you know from the department stores to luxury travel where we've expanded today, gourmet foods, products for your home, products for your children. Initially, uh, that business, as I mentioned, started with women's. However, that business that seems so simple at its base is actually incredibly hard to execute. On a day-to-day -day basis, we have over 15,000 items laid out of our warehouse. Out of people coming in and buying over a half billion products on the site, all of that purchasing happens, well, roughly 70% of that purchasing happens in just 90 minutes a day. So from the very beginning, that first morning on board, we had to figure out how to become a very large, e-commerce player, but only for 90 minutes each day. So things like investing in cloud computing and the rest from the very beginning was critically important to how we scale. We also had to learn how to uh, um, take a business in which literally hundreds of thousands of consumers rush through a virtual door to make a purchase at right at 12 noon Eastern every single day. And we definitely hit our parts, our growth spurts and the rest where we would after mention on The View, which occurred five months in, um, watch our membership double in a matter of, of, of really two hours. Uh, and I'll have to then rethink, how do we build out every part of this business? We, we experienced a lot of, of shocks to the system as the business grew. A business that grew mostly virally through word of mouth. And the five million people that are shopping on, on Yield today, uh, over 60% over of them came in to find a little about the site. So along that trajectory, um, while we benefited from that viral growth, it meant that as a company, we really had to think about, okay, with this train taking off by itself, uh, that business that we rolled out uh, initially for our friends and friends of friends, the one that didn't even have a return section, and it scaled to first uh, um, service a million people at the end of 12 months, and then fast forward to about three million and up to over five million where we are today, the business has almost been rebuilt start to finish probably three times over that history. The business that we rolled out the door that morning that was servicing our friends um, from start to finish, from the entrance as you log into the site, all the way back through back end systems to warehousing facilities, through to how we're getting the product out to our customer. Internally, we, we, we think about it as we know every part of our business is going to break at some point because of the pressures of growth, the pressures of uh, inbound customer demand that's coming in. How as a team do we get really good at being disciplined and focusing on what is going to break next because it will and trying to get ahead of it so it doesn't drown our business to a halt. Uh, initially, it was first a, a very actually funny episode that we realized that we are coming upon that moment where we first have to rebuild the entire business again from uh, infrastructure to a physical infrastructure uh, when we hosted our very first sale of Christian Louboutin. Women in the audience, you might not know that this is a very exciting brand to many women in New York City and outside of New York City. But especially none of our engineers fully appreciated how popular it was when we had watched literally 200,000 women try to buy the exact single pair of shoes the very same second, uh, in the same size, and that that intensity brought our systems down for literally probably about a 24 hour period. That signaled to us that, wow, okay, here it's starting now. We've got to first begin at the front of the site, rebuild the entire purchase funnel from an e-commerce standpoint, how a person flows through your site from start to finish, so that that kind of full throttle can, can get through to the transaction. And fast forward as as we watched membership double on, on what became a quarterly basis, same thing. We struggled to keep up with the demand and pressures on our warehousing staff. 
where what was a promise and a commitment to get the item to a customer in a day or two, all of a sudden started stretching to five or six days. Again, it was a testament to the fact that every year, every part of our business seemed to be breaking in a way that we had to get in front of it and rethink it. At that point, we took uh, uh, basically two months out, which in a startup is eternity, to rethink, all right, how are we going to tackle the pressures this is putting on our distribution and logistics? How can we take um, a system that has worked pretty well to date and completely rethink it? Hence, um, what was a two-month move to, um, to uh, robotics and logistics in our warehouse space that occurred uh, two years ago. We had to um, literally stop the presses, take all of our engineering force, a bunch of our logistics force as well, and rebuild the warehouse start from start to end. Um, but this I just want to highlight because there are a number of uh, challenges, and, and we write about quite a bit of them in the book. We write about some of the fun successes. For those of you interested in fashion, we also will look at behind the scenes of, of kind of the New York fashion scene as well. But there are uh, about four challenges I really wanted to focus on and, and also I was asked to, to think about as well coming in here. Um, the first was um, thinking about how, um, how particularly you know, in that growth scenario we have to think about building the team and, and scaling from there. We knew that given the first inclinations we, we would be going through a period of growth. And in that growth, um, we would have uh, to have a, a core set of employees that had to be incredibly flexible to react to whatever might come our way. So in the uh, first two years, literally every person we would interview, we would say quite honestly that this is a business going through a lot of growth. So by coming on board at Guild, there's a few things I can guarantee. I can guarantee that the role that you're taking right now in signing up uh, with us could be or will be entirely different come three or six months from now. That the role that you have on paper right now and that you're interviewing for will appear to shrink over time. If you are running women's and men's and kids merchandising, you'll be managing a sliver of one of those businesses come two years from now. But that that's a good thing. It's a sign that we're doing the right thing, we're growing, uh, you'll be managing probably twice the P&L or four times the number of people that you have today. But that's a, that's a really scary thing for a lot of people. And I had, I had my early roots at, at eBay and had been with that business as it scaled from 50 to 5,000 people over a four year time period as well. And I had watched a lot of people fight against that growth and say, you know, this isn't comfortable. Um, I'm losing ground, I'm losing face because my role seems to be shrinking. And in that, you get a lot of turnover. You have people who are saying, this isn't, I, I gotta leave, this isn't the company I wanted. So really felt strongly about giving everyone the heads up that that was coming. And that by coming on board at Guild, you're raising your hand and knowing that that is something that was a part and parcel to you joining the company. That you had to be flexible, that you had to know and be comfortable with the fact that your role was gonna change every three to six months and that it would never look the same on paper down the road. And that gave people the ability to sign up and say it was for me, or fair enough, it's not for everyone, uh, the ability to opt out right then and there. So the, the, the need for flexibility we recognized from the beginning, and we try to hire for it, bake it into our, our, our culture, and think about it from um, in, in every facet possible, so that as we had to adopt to so many changes that came our way, we could. Um, Second, I, I emphasize a little bit about getting our first brands and our partners signed up. And now there are a lot of fashion startups. There's a lot of uh, kind of reinvigoration of e-commerce that's happened recently. But back then, it was really a hard sell because we were dealing mostly with people who didn't sell their product online. That were certainly allergic to the word discount. And were certainly not necessarily uh, uh, eager to work with a brand that they couldn't even yet uh, see the, the prototype or the, the design for the site. So the sale process was, was one where we really had to not just um, paint the picture, uh, educate them on e-commerce, but we had to very much say um, that we were going to treat their brand not with respect alone, but actually find ways to enhance it. That, that this business was one that was going to introduce them to new customers that weren't coming to the store today. This was a business that 
um, would create excitement around the, around the brand that would serve as a, a vehicle for you to acquire new customers. And, uh, and we had actually, through some of the concern we ran into, had to do things that were considered uh, atypical or in some cases e-commerce death at that point that we would take a registration, that it would be by invitation only, that your results wouldn't show up on, on a Google search page. So that they had that feeling of, well, this is a safe place to test, test the business. Um, and it ended up being very exciting to our customers, the feeling of getting in behind a velvet rope, being able to purchase brands that they didn't have access to. And, uh, and the ability to, um, through what was an uh, invitation only process that we put in place, become our marketers, become the, the staff of people that were going out there and inviting friends, saying, this, these are the people in my life who most want to shop this way. Um, so as we got started, of course, marketing budgets were not very deep then at all. And we had to find a way to get the word out cost effectively and quickly. Um, social media is certainly a lot more developed today and is critical to us as we move forward, but then it was um, much less developed vis-a-vis -vis Facebook and Twitter, Pinterest and, uh, and the like, but what has always been the case and something that we really benefited from is that people today gather online in these micro-tribes. They all identify with passions they have, deep interests. We were able to reach out to 500 you know, small communities of people who were just gathered around specific brands of handbags. And, uh, and we were relentless in reaching out to those communities, reaching out to groups through kind of guerrilla tactics, if you will, on campuses, self-identified uh, leaders of organizations, whether it was real estate uh, agents in, in um, Scottsdale, Arizona, or if it were um, heads of uh, um, uh, technology t uh, clubs on, on for uh, of the top 40 campuses in this country. So we reached out to those, we reached out to our own networks, we gave them incentive to refer their friends, um, and then we kind of sat back after the first couple months and said, how, how far have our networks taken us? Where are the open holes? Where are the voids? And then we kind of looked towards what was a practice that I guess we'll see in full force this upcoming election cycle. But we, we thought about our next phase as our ground game. So we could see very quickly how far our networks had spread, where were the key nodes, but we also could see where we were really underrepresented in a, from a geographic standpoint. We didn't have the same penetration in Dallas that we expected, or in Seattle, or in Southern California. And taking that concept of a ground game, actually borrowing some from my experience at, at eBay, we had targeted those regions where we could really go in deeper, find a, a reason to go to that area. Maybe it was the uh, uh, advanced screening of a movie, maybe it was a fashion show we could introduce, maybe um, it was a special event that we could bring that would really start generating buzz in those local areas. We'd bring together specific uh, kind of other hosts, if you will, create a large event, um, pepper local um, media and blogs and other influencers on a, uh, on a local basis, and then revisit that area on a kind of succinct once every um, three to four month basis. Again, so that we're trying to push the word of mouth out from new nodes or across the country, identifying territories where we should be a lot more penetrated, but just hadn't been that far. So getting the word out, you know, we focused on what were people already talking about um, in common conversation with friends? How could we get guilt further embedded using tools uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, and now increasingly uh, ones like Pinterest, uh, and, and give them reason to share that information regularly with friends? We looked at the website and thought, OK, well, we're having sales once every it was, uh, at that point, three times a week. So we need to make the content even fresher, changing it out every single day so that people had a reason to come back and again spread that news uh, out further to their friends. I think some of the things that made Guilt very dynamic was the fact that for the first time, we were creating a business where any time you came to shop on Guilt, the lineup was always ent entirely different. Uh, no two days would you come and find the same product. It was uh, very tightly curated. It was a small subset of products and brands that you'd want to shop for. It was not more is more, but in fact, less is more. And we had taken a step back and looked at the way product was being sold online at that point. 
It was on mannequins or being laid flat on a white panel. It, never, it didn't tell a story. You didn't get that same excitement as flipping through the pages of uh, an Esquire or um, a, a uh, Elle magazine. Um, and so we wanted to take that kind of rich imagery, seeing a product actually on a person, um, in the, the design aesthetic of a dining room, find a way to actually give life to the product, to romance the product, create excitement by getting a full sense of what it might look like together uh, with styling and the like, but not have that be the experience that ends on the magazine page. That is for the first time just a click or two clicks away to purchase. We would look at how we set up the site and made it so that from start, entry to uh, checkout, tightly editing it so that we at any time could have enable a person to come in through the front door and out with a purchase in under two clicks. That they could do it and if needed in 45 seconds. It was a very competitive process so we wanted to remove as many hurdles as possible, uh, strip out as many buttons as possible, keep the navigation and the aesthetic of the site design as clean as possible so you could get in and get out really, really fast. As I look forward in terms of what is shaping guilt today, and I, I'll just talk about a couple topics and I'll let open it up to questions. Um, the major things that are driving us today is the fact that while we started a requiring membership or requiring sign up when you first joined guilt group, and thought that that it, and people thought that that was a really bad idea. In fact, as we move forward now, nearing on five years, it means that we have a tremendous amount of information on our customer down to the individual basis. When a customer comes to us, he or she tells us a lot by their click stream, what they're clicking, viewing on the site, what they purchase, what they tell their friends about and share, what they tried to buy but couldn't, the sizes. And that information now allows us, as we move from what is initially just three lineup of sales a day to over 150 sales that are taking place on our site today, to get better and better at just targeting the five to 10 sales that you're most likely you want to see. I think of it as predictive commerce. As a person walks in through our front door, we're using all that information, that big data, if you will, to streamline the experience so that we're, again, at every turn, decluttering the site as much as possible and just putting the items in front of the customer that she or he will want to see. That uh, goes to our communication, too. So when you get an email from Guild Group, it might appear that there's just one version of that email going out. But based on your preferences and what you've told us about your lifestyle and what brands you like, where you like to travel, there are over 3,000 iterations of that single email that we send out based on what we know about you, the customer. And again, it's with that intention of having a person come in and feel like, wow, this site knows me. They understand me. They're only serving me up for the, uh, with the sales that I want to see. So the importance of capturing that information um, uh, is critical to us. The importance of investing in teams, especially within the engineering department, um, very good at building those regression analyses. Um, putting that closer and closer to real time uh, as much as possible, the way in which we communicate and send out that email on a database, a daily basis, um, having that start to inform what we're doing through uh, pop-up messaging on mobile, critical, and in other uh, messaging platforms as we move forward. And again, having that uh, follow you through the site experience. Um, something else that's incredibly critical uh, to us as a business and that we, on that theme of having to be incredibly flexible that, and, and in the theme of us having to re-envision our business on such a frequent basis. We've watched over the past 12 months our business shift from being 0% essentially revenues coming in over mobile devices to what is today nearly 30% on a weekday of our revenues coming in over an iPad and iPhone. Again, that was something that we never would have foreseen 12 months ago, but that has changed the way that we are building out our product, our site, um, staffing our engineering team, so that we're actually beginning a lot of our innovation on the iPad, uh, starting there, uh, putting in a mobile engineer on every team, every project we're working on, but allowing that to drive product innovation across the entire um, web experience. We've had to learn um, and think very uh, intently about how our customer is using an iPad in a moment of leisure or how a customer is rushing, well actually, I was gonna say rushing to catch a taxi and making a purchase and 
a car on their iPhone, but actually in reality, they're sitting in meetings at 12 o'clock and usually shopping on that iPhone. So if someone looks like they're seriously intently um, checking email, they might just be bidding, or excuse me, going after that item on, on Guild Group that they want to purchase. So um, we've had to think about how the mindset of our customer evolves or is different when they're sitting on that couch in the evenings or on a weekend purchasing over the iPad um, as they are in a moment of must buy this quickly, rush between meetings, in a meeting, whatever it might be, purchasing on the iPhone and rethink the products we're surfacing, how we're designing for that mindset, and uh, importantly, having to invest even more in the than we, we've had to, honestly, in many ways, in the scalability and stability of our mobile apps and we have had in our, uh, to think uh, this day and age in, in our website alone. Um, we know that should the, uh, with our image in, uh, intensity that we have on the site, should our app not be the most scalable, fast as possible, um, that should it crash once, should it crash twice, it's highly likely that our customers aren't gonna come back to that app. So focusing on the mindset, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the stability of that experience is entirely new. And given our trajectory already to date in 12 months watching how much that has shifted, it's not crazy for us to think that in uh, 12 to, to 24 months from today, we could be a majority, if not heavily majority based uh, mobile sales business. Uh, beyond that, social has always been core to our, our roots as a business. Social um, media has been very much uh, a part and parcel to how we scaled um, really over three million of our customer base in such a short time period. As we look at it today though, it's not just a key area for customer acquisition for us, which it is. It's not just a key area to kind of keep uh, the, our products directly embedded in the conversation through on-the-wall selling on Facebook or having a way that every single product is shareable, pitable, um, tweetable, you name it. We, we know that it's critical to keep our business and our product directly embedded in the conversation that blows up every day at noon, really noon to 1.30, around products on sale on Guild. But it's become one of the primary ways we service our customer. So embedded directly in our customer support team, we have an entire staff that is constantly monitoring the internet, not just for the good comments and responding to those directly and quickly, but more importantly to any kind of concerns a customer has, any problem they run into with a purchase, uh, addressing any questions, whether or not it's been addressed directly to us as a business. Uh, we, try in about an hour or two to respond to questions wherever they might be and find that as one of the most critical ways we're moving forward our customer support. It allows us in, in kind of a faceless internet environment to generate much more of a one-to-one -one communication with our customer for them to feel like, again, I have direct contact with Guild. I, they, they, they care about me, they're there, and, uh, and the response that we get to that is, is quite strong. And I think the last thing that is really shaping our business as we move forward beyond the personalization, beyond mobile, is really what is, was really at our core and our roots, which was that merger between editorial and commerce. You know, while it started as us just emulating the pages of a fashion magazine and trying to bring that online for the first time, that excitement, that thrill, that discovery, and have that purchase just be a click away, I think we're gonna see that change even more so as you're thinking about buying a product, it's never just in isolation, but you now come to Guilt and you can see a product set specifically in the living room environment and it was intended. Uh, the ability to um, look specifically at um, the way that we view content. It's not content written words, it's content image, uh, imagery alone. And the, the ability for you to come ca capture very quickly a, looking at a page on Guilt Group what is for sale? What is, the, uh, what is the, the style that has been put forward? Is it for me? What is the story that I'm supposed to pick up in terms of what to wear on my next business trip? Um, we are gonna further push uh, innovation through using um, images and video and uh, the ability to quickly gather information and make a picture based on, um, uh, on online or uh, editorial kind of aesthetic, if you will, 
um, using images first and foremost, and the ability to purchase directly from deep and very rich imagery. So um, again, uh, I want to thank you for coming. I am going to open up for questions, but um, watching an idea take off as, as many times as you might fall on your face getting it uh, off the ground, having the ability to pursue something you're so incredibly passionate about and watching it grow to something much larger than you could ever have envisioned is, is, is something that I highly recommend. I think I'm pre preaching to the choir here, but uh, thank you for you know, listening to me as I described a little bit about the early days. And if you're interested after the q and I will be over here for more questions or uh, if you want to take a look at the book. We, t we wrote it um, mostly covering the first three years of the guilt experience. Um, but specifically looked at topics around how to think about raising capital and, and managing that process, building a team, uh, choosing a partner in an effective manner, um, how to think about branding in, um, in the world of kind of fashion and uh, design and, and technology. So again, thank you, and I'll open it up to questions. Well, the question is, for those of you who couldn't hear over there, is where is e-commerce going in the next couple of years? And I, I hinted at some of the direction that I think it's going based on where we're investing. But I've already, through the experience of, of, of Gilt, and Gilt, believe it or not, is a top 10 mobile retailer in this country right now, alongside of the Walmarts of the world. And uh, that was pretty surprising to learn that. But I really believe that we're going to watch the store migrate to the pocket. So. If uh, it was already a big leap for people to think about, how do I envision my um, flagship store moving to, the, to, to my website? That was a big leap. I think now we're going to watch that change even faster as we think about, well, how do I migrate my flagship store or my e-commerce business directly to an in-store, in-pocket experience? Um, People are increasingly buying uh, over, over iPads and iPhones at a rate um, and switching to those as the key device at a rate faster than I've ever seen. We watched um, iPads outpace the sale of PC and, uh, and other devices for the first time in Q4 2010, and that's only accelerated in terms of the shift. And uh, it's, it's just it's such an incredibly rich experience um, uh, through especially the tablet devices that I think that's a big area in which product will be sold, uh, the majority way in which product will be sold in the future. Um, I think there is the expectation in e-commerce, um, and this is the second comment I'll, I'll make on this. There's so much on offer out there. There is so much noise. There's so many things you can buy, especially in the areas of design, but uh, you name it, that I think it's going to be you know, increasingly difficult to break through the clutter. And you know, a simple way to do it in the early stages is just to really have a very tight focus and remember that for the customer, really less is more. Here are the few things that I stand for. Here's my tightly uh, pulled together uh, design and selection of product that I think is most pertinent to you, the shopper. But more importantly, I think it's going to put a lot of onus on e-commerce players to be very, very good at understanding their uh, customer base before the customer asks them for that, for that even. Um, very good at identifying a singular customer coming in and anticipating what he or she wants to see bef before they even raise their hands for it. And I'm not talking about filling out dashboards as they come in, really getting smart about using the data you capture, adding in outside data, um, pulling in um, information from uh, the social graph, to inform what that customer is looking for and how that customer lives his or her life. I think the expectation will be, you better know me, you better anticipate my needs and respond to them directly. So I think that's where e-commerce is going. Sure. And in terms of, I have two questions. One of them, since the beginning up until now, margin-wise, I think that Margin-wise, if you can talk about what was happening then and what if you managed to keep margin or they went up or down, and what are the biggest challenges that you see coming up? From a product perspective in particular? I think mainly from a product perspective. As in the product we sell or the, web, the website? Product we the, sell. The product like. that you sell, yes. And could everyone hear the question over there? It was, 
um, what's happened with margins over time, if you can talk about it, and what, what are uh, trends in the product as more, you move more forward? Like challenges because like what we see is a lot of, uh, there is a lot of other sites that are doing the same thing, and okay. a lot of retailers, because price is the most important thing for the user, so. Oh, sorry, it was ch challenges around uh, specifically product inventory yeah. that you foresee. Um, it's a great question. Uh, at the beginning, uh, clearly we had a lot less purchasing power as we were walking in uh, to um, brands and asking for 10,000 of merchandise, 15,000 of merchandise. We knew that scale was really important to our business as we grew, that we had a lot, it, there was a, uh, many players that possibly were entering the space in the future, so getting big quickly was very important to our business. It was important because as we walked into a key brand, say a Ralph Lauren, we could, we could um, be in a much better position if we were working across all five divisions and taking 500,000 or millions in inventory as opposed to entering and saying, please, just can you give us 10? And so that's a key way in which, um, it, why we've grown and why we wanted to grow quickly, but a key way in which we're actually um, making it difficult for new entrants to come in. Um, as a result, as our buying has gone deeper, and as we are now servicing and selling to about five million customers, it, we have a little bit more buying power, and that is reflected in the margin structures that we achieve. Um, but granted, as we sell for five million people, we've had to really start shaping the inventory that we want to provide on the site. It's not just as, as saying, okay, well, we'll take what is no longer on the SACS floor and we'll sell it. We have to go into the planning process with our brands. We literally, at this point, will sit down with some of our, you know, let's call it our top 200 brands, and at the beginning of their business cycle, their beginning of their calendar year, we'll say, Gilt is gonna sell this much product over the next four quarters, four seasons, two seasons, whatever it might be. So we're working and placing orders directly alongside department stores, uh, directly at the beginning of a a planning year for them so that they know how much should be produced for guilt. And that's that's important because knowing the, the kind of trajectory of our base and how it's growing and growing largely virally, we can never be in a position to have too little inventory. On the flip side, we don't want to have too much too, so it's kind of a perfect balance. As we've gotten uh, to a point where we're building either capsule collections or having um, same inventory uh, coming in our direction that goes to a department store, we've had to figure out how to mitigate the risk a little bit so that we're not sitting with too much inventory. So um, through uh, investments in uh, the warehousing space, in the way that we buy, product on Guild increasingly is being produced and photographed off, off of samples, meaning we'll get an, one example of that look and we'll photograph it. We'll get a sense of how much of it is available. We'll do the sale. We'll see how many we sell. And then we'll very quickly turn to the partner and say, send us 999 of these button-down white shirts or uh, X number of these looks, uh, et cetera, across the sale. They'll come in quickly and go out within a matter of days out to the customer. But so we, we've kind of uh, experimented with how we remove risk by switching uh, when we take the inventory, how we pay for it, at what time we might shoot it, sell it, versus actually have it come through our distribution. And with certain large products, uh, you'd be surprised by how well um, large inventory, uh, like rugs and area, large area rugs sell on the site, as well as sofas and the like. And those don't even, touch, we don't even touch. They go directly out from a partner. Sorry, the light's bright, so I gotta come Sorry. move over here. Do you think you guys would be um, expanding internationally? And if so, do you anticipate that being an international Oh, I've already great stories on that one. <laughs> uh, well, we expanded in 2009 to uh, Japan. And we have a team there. And again, uh, I was um, running our, I was originally uh, founding CEO of Gill Group and I ran it for about the first year and a half. And then um, amongst the many roles I've had throughout my time at Gilt, um, running international and, and starting Gilt Japan was one. Um, I should say today we ship to over 100 countries and we are servicing customers globally already through Gilt. 
and, um, and are getting more agnostic to where product is and how we get it out to the customer. We haven't taken the approach, except in the case of Japan, of building teams uh, country by country. Um, we we um, are trying to do fulfillment and service, a broader um, audience um, being less worried about if the product's in country already or not. Because it's a multinational demand for the product, there's multinational uh, craving for the luxury products we sell, so we don't want to move them into country and out. We, we want to just get really good at wherever that product sits, getting it to the customer, wherever he or she might be. But as we went into Japan, and this is a testament to, to some other ways that we we'll have to think about our business as we continue to s expand. Um, there, when we launched the business, we had to launch first thinking about it from a mobile standpoint. That, that's what drives our sales there. People are sh purchasing during commuting times and on the weekends. They're completely taboo, unlike this country, to shop at work on your boss's time. It's completely taboo. So we're, we're like, ooh, how are we going to deal with that? I mean, it's just part and parcel for how you do work here in, in America. So um, we did have to look at cultural nuances quite a bit. Um, how we were reaching the customer through mobile there. When we'd set up our sale times then, it had to be during prime commuting hours. And of course, in Tokyo, you're rushing home at 9 and sitting in a train for an hour or two before you get back home. And um, we had to think about certain products by, by uh, different markets, which would perform better. So in that case, you know, large home decor categories, not, not so popular, smaller apartment sizes. Again, European uh, sizing and luxury brands um, be more of a movement towards accessories, jewelry, and uh, say uh, other categories as opposed to, to just apparel. So yeah, we had to look at, in that market, um, a lot of the different cultural norms, the taboos, um, and think about shaping the product and the experience differently. Mm -hmm. So initially, um, there, there were a couple influences that came together to shape the idea. One was our um, own passion, Alexander, my own passion of going out of our day jobs to, to sneak into these designer sample sales that happen in New York City, and really mostly only in New York City. That uh, the way in which we would drop everything to be there, the way we, we love to purchase <laughs> Um, from our favorite designers in that way. That, that inspiration really motivated us to think about how we're building the site, what brands we would feature. We put ourselves in the, foot, uh, the footsteps of the customer. We, we clearly didn't have any large research budget, so we thought, I'm the target customer, I'm gonna build this for myself and our friends, and this is how we would like the experience to be. Um, at the same time, uh, the very early stages of Guilt there was a business in Europe that was taking off and ended up getting financing a couple months into our, um, into in, a couple months into the time frame of, of Guilt getting started. And it was a business called Bon Privé that got a quite high valuation. It had a, a couple of facts uh, and influences on our business. One, it meant that we knew we had to run even faster because that was setting off the dinner bells, the, the, the alarms at every single um, venture capital. Uh, firm in this country saying, oh, let's try to back a similar idea. Let's see what else is out there. But second, it made, um, it, it, it caused our own investors, initially the original kind of seed investors and later our institutional VC investors to think, well, here's what they're doing. You know, maybe, maybe we should try thinking that way too. And theirs was a much more mass market um, offering. There would be some uh, toasters all the way to to, to many different things already on sale there. And uh, if anything, um, it caused a, a lot more kind of question or pushback on our own model. Are you sure we should be doing it this way? Shouldn't we just start with um, uh, mass market brands that would reach a big swath of people really quickly? 
Um, and we really had to think about, well, what was the brand we wanted to create? What would get customers like us most excited? What would cause them to drop, drop everything at noon to be on there shopping for our sales? And, and as we were building our own brand guilt too, um, certain um, areas, categories, brands would have a lot of very nice adjacencies as we brought a certain meaning to that, that own uh, brand name we were trying to cultivate. So it very much shaped uh, was shaped by our own passions and our own ideas, um, but there did start to be uh, people cropping up doing uh, similar um, elements uh, two months in, five months in, seven months in that did cause us to look and think, you know, are we doing this right or not? Um, our idea has pivoted so many times, it really has. We, we really truly launched the business initially thinking this would be a great way for many of our partners to sell end of season inventory. Fashion, for those of you who don't know, works like four months in advance. So even though it's 95 degrees out there right now, they're about to move into fall product at all the department stores. And that's not really what we're thinking about wearing. So that left an opportunity for us to basically take certain um, inventory or spoilable goods that were gonna quickly you know, be last season, even though it's what we wanna wear now. And, and that opened up an opportunity. Um, but four months in, as we started getting calls from these highly vertically integrated brands that we thought would never wanna sell this way, we kind of had an aha moment, another one. I think any startup is a, is a formation of about 20 aha moments. But we had a moment where we realized these big brands are coming to work with us, but they don't need us in the way that we thought they'd need us. And it turned out they were facing, in their stores, declining traffic. Um, a customer base that's aging, and that's normal, but they needed to really rethink how they're gonna get another generation involved with their brand, buying their brand, rethinking of it in a different way. And that's where Gilt came in. And again, how we had to pivot an idea to think of ourselves more as a unique way in, for pairing new customers with known brands that they're thinking about in a different way or brands they hadn't yet discovered. It was much more of a marketing platform than we realized. Uh, I have a question from uh, an IT standpoint because it sounds like you have pretty complex challenges. Um, and that you were in on the stability of this fashion and it's, you know, she hears a pretty good we, well, one, funny story and then true story. Um, so one, uh, uh, originally found one of our, our, our co-worker, Mike, uh, co-founder Mike Brizik, MIT trained engineer. All engineers move in packs, they really do. They try, you know, you gotta get one uh, as either an advisor, a co-founder, or involved in some level with the business and then they're through referrals. You know, engineers don't love to interview. And they, again, I really believe they only travel in packs. So by getting one good one involved, you know, from there we were able to hire quite a bit. Um, when they realized we did our model, uh, uh, scouting, staffing, and scheduling 11 a.m.s on Wednesday mornings, they started scheduling all their meetups or interviews with uh, prospective engineers at 11 a.m. on Wednesdays. So. That's actually true too. So we'd watch these um, engineers walk in. We're like, why are you scheduling all your interviews at 11 a.m.? And then we'd see you know, 12 Amazonian women in, in, up front and these guys walk in and think, oh God, I really want to work at Guild. This place is for me. And, uh, and that, that did happen. Um, but a big struggle for us from the very beginning, because your question you know, it was, it was mostly male. And this was a big, very hard challenge uh, to, to figure out how to sustain a business that in the very beginning had to be an Amazon for an hour and a half. How to scale a business so that you know 200,000 people would be buying the same item. Um, we were using a lot of very new development uh, uh, frameworks and languages and when we kind of did our own engineering marketing if you will, um, that's exactly the tack we would take through our blog, our engineering blog, through presence at um, at different um, uh, engineering conferences, we'd focus on all the really hard problems that had to be solved. And that's a huge area of traction for, for engineering talent. And, um, and lastly, our a big challenge still today is get more female engineers. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, there's a very cool initiative that just kicked off in New York City called Girls Who Code. So I encourage you, if you're in a position to, 
to bring in some of these uh, women getting selected across the New York City public school systems, getting uh, the in initiative, getting them um, more and more interested in coding. Uh, a lot of them are already hacking, but getting them to want to stay in it as a career. And you have the ability to bring them in and, and perhaps train one of them or have them in as an intern. I highly encourage it, Girls Who Code. It's a very cool initiative. Huh? Uh, it's uh, being run by a woman named Kristen Titus and Reshma Saujani, who is a rising political star in New York City. All right. Um, any other questions? I know uh, you've had your hand up forever, so I will take your question. Uh, thank you for sharing your fascinating story. Uh, story. Um, I went to the fashion hackathon. Yeah. A couple of weekends. Did you ago. hack away at anything or create anything? A little bit. I have some thoughts and ideas. Yeah. It's a really fun uh, event. I'm just wondering, is that a recurring event? Will it happen soon? Um, we do it about once every six months, and it's, um, it's, it's, we get huge rave reviews. The question is, there's a hackathon, a fashion hackathon at Gilt. Um, we had it just about a week ago. Tons of people come in for it, and it's just a great opportunity to work on something really passionate about, have our engineering staff around, get uh, like-minded, um, and you know, uh, hackers all together in a room. So what are the goals you want to achieve as chief uh, strategy officer through hosting these hackathon events, opening up APIs? I think the more open you can have your site and systems uh, and allow others to innovate through, um, through APIs, through um, hackathons, uh, are a great way just to bring new ideas up to the surface that you might not be thinking of as a company. It's a great way to get our engineering staff uh, alongside with other um, high potential engineers in the New York area with great ideas. Um, for you to know the hard challenges we're working on in case you have ideas that could work and for you to maybe glimmer something um, interesting about what we're doing that might spur a new idea, a new business or, or something else that we eventually partner with or or something more down the road. Yeah, you're right. I did see a couple of uh, guild engineers in that hackathon just compete for the Oh, they're, they're, they're fiercely competitive. They yeah. want to they wanna win it. Well, thank you for coming, by the way. All right, one last question. Um, I think I heard you said you're actively adjusting time and We, I'm sorry, we're not doing just-in-time production on fashion items. What we do is we partner with a brand that might have, let's just say, a thousand items in inventory. Uh, we will take samples, meaning just one of each style. We'll bring it into our studios here in, in Brooklyn. We have about 12 studios constantly on double shift, putting out um, 18,000 photographs a week. Um, we'll photograph those items We'll create the sale, host the sale, we'll see the demand of how much um, people purchase, and then we'll go and place the order for that product, saying, get us 999. Yes, yes, yes. What we do today, the question is creating our own brands, again, to fill the pipeline and to service the amount of demand we have. We're creating the product we need from the standpoint of we need this much Mark by Mark Jacobs um, uh, throughout our next calendar year. Um, we do do capsule collections, like we recently did a special capsule collection is a product that you can only find on Gilt with the likes of Donna Karen. We do we do, do a lot of those as well to kind of for the for the excitement that they engender and, and the interest level it has amongst customers. All right. Well, I'll be back there, sorry. Um, but thank you again so much for coming out tonight.